Well, I can see the Parkway Church inside, and I can see two other people. It might be as well as I can do. <laughs> Adelaide, is there a particular, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. yeah. Is there a particular password that we're supposed to use? Mm. I, can you can you not go on the uh, did you not go on the website? I I mean go on the email bulletin? on the bulletin. No. Uh, Link on your email. I, I see two of you. And I see this sign. Now go into Did you choose the gallery? Uh, I don't seem to. Welcome into this broken vessel you desire to abide in the praises of your people so we lift our hands and we lift our hearts and we offer up this praise unto your name amen Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Holy Spirit. Welcome to you both here and online. You are welcome here, no matter your race, ethnicity, your gender identity, your sexuality, your income, your belief, whether you are a seasoned Christian or you're still searching and wondering, no matter how you got here today, no matter where you live, no matter if you have welcomed fall or if you're lamenting the leaving of summer, you are welcome here. So again, I say welcome. Right now we will have a prelude by Guillermo de la Garza. Thank you. Thank you. 
have mercy on me. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. You know, it's always uh, grabs hold of me that the mountain range we're tucked up against here in North Carolina is the same mountain range of Northwest Africa before the continent split, the same mountain range of the highlands of Scotland. We are one as, as humanity. It's striking to me in the book we're reading by Ibrahim Kendi right now, he states there's more genetic diversity among people in the continent of Africa than there is other descended folk and those living in Africa. I don't know about you, but I could take a minute and just get in touch with the body. Take a deep, slow breath in. Maybe place your feet on the floor. Breathe out. Maybe close your eyes or soften your gaze. Get in touch with a place in your body where there's a source and sensation of strength, of centeredness. And then maybe to consider a place in your body, get in touch with a place where there's discomfort, maybe pain, where you're holding anguish or stress. And just send graciousness and tenderness to that part of your body. Merciful one, we bring our whole selves to worship. And we know you show up to our whole selves in your whole selves as well. Our opening this morning are excerpts from St. Francis's Canticle to Brother Sun and Sister Moon. Our lips do our best, but it's hard to do justice to the full sound of your name. Praise to you, sacred energy through sibling moon and the stars bright, precious, and fair. Praise to you, wind, air, all precious Praise to you, through, play, through fire playful and strong and earth, who sustain us with fruit, flower, and herb. Praise to you, through death, for whom no one can escape. If you will now please stand and join in our opening song, To You, O God, All Creatures Sing.
Did you bring him? What? Oh god. I'm watching, I got, finally got in. Selected that hymn not only because it's St. Francis Day, but in honor of a dear professor and chaplain at my college whose life was celebrated last weekend, Reverend David Lauer. On Sunday morning chapel, he'd have us sing that thing week after week after week. Didn't matter how many times we'd sing it, he'd throw his head back, he'd smile, and his tobacco stained teeth. Ah, oh, he loved that song. <laughs> I see dogs. I see picture of a cat. I see an octopus. We pause just to acknowledge our deep connection to pets, to creatures. Maybe we just encounter them briefly, or maybe they sleep at our feet every night. So call forth what it is that you lift up in thanksgiving and remembrance. Bandit. Noodle. JJ. Murphy. Leia. The snuggler. Cassie, Josie Huckleberry, Josie Huckleberry. Jace. Jace, Zoe, Zoe. Hi. Dora, Dora. Layla Marie, Claravel, <laughs> and Honey, Dakota, Dakota. Jurgen, Takoa. Libby, Ritz, Ritz. Barney, Barney. <laughs> Mandu Cat, Mandu Cat. Mandu Cat. <laughs> Lexi, Lexi. Lady Bug. Ladybug, Chopper, Chopper. Harold, Vincent, Harold Vincent Travis Kelsey. <laughs> Callie and Socrates. Duchess. Duchess. Saturn and Einstein, who does not live up to his name. 
Saturn and Einstein. Well, we fold all of these and many more into our community of love and hope. Our beloved pets. Now we'll have prayer concerns and celebrations. Um, we want to lift up Mary M, Amy Liz, Cynthia N, Jim W, Pauline J, Bill D, Deborah W, Margaret R, Roseanne's husband, Jim and Sterling's Travel. I'm going to ask that if you are on Zoom, you would go ahead and type your prayer request in the chat. I'm gonna lift up these two because I'm not sure if they were seen. Um, just to go back a little bit, um, Millie and Ollie, Gizmo, Milo, Giselle and Nico. All right. <laughs> Did, didn't want to leave them off. All right. Let me look up a little bit more. Pepe, Kimmy Lou, and Opie and Maggie. They are important. Gerbil, um, Taffy. <laughs> Baxter, <laughs> Gilly, Mira, all right, got them all. And there's, um, Diane lifts up um, her sister-in-law, Ruth, and family. Adelaide is asking for um, peace for all. Peggy Matthews is lifting up her granddaughter, Natalie, who is ready to deliver a little baby girl. Um, so pray for her and um, a healthy delivery. Um, lifting up Francie's brother-in-law, Bill, who has been diagnosed with ALS. Um, prayer for Beth, for praise for the full moon this um, weekend, and a great um, Zoom reconnection. So I'm um, here in the sanctuary. Uh, go ahead and lift up prayer requests and concerns and celebrations. Yes, Craig. That's awesome. Happy birthday, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yes, Madeline. Sterling is offering thanks and appreciation um, for him and his family in their time of bereavement and grief for your love outpouring of just care and the cards that you've sent, your thoughtful and kind words on behalf of he and Tim. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to lift up my daughter, J.L., who's in school and still adjusting to being away from home. If we could all just hold a moment of silence for these requests, these thanks that have been lift, lifted, and these celebrations, for those things that have not been said, but you and God know what they are and they're just as important and just as special.
Now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught in a language that is familiar to you. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thine kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, let's prepare. I think it is the music of preparation. Passing the peace. Okay, I'm, I'm think I'm looking at something else. So let us pass the peace <laughs> safely and with consent. Pass the peace. Peace to you all. Peace. Peace. Sorry, passing of the peace should last a little longer. <laughs> if you will uh, join me in the prayer of confession. Those of us who can turn on a tap to wash, to drink, to cook, to water, call into our awareness all our global neighbors who suffer extreme water stress. May we live aware of actions and policies that can increase their access to clean water. Amen. Our season of star conversations continues. So the questions that we're inviting people to have conversation around is, how are you a star here in this spiritual community? How are we helping nurture your star, stardom, your starship? And then how do you imagine us collectively continuing to shed twinkliness to the wider community? And so uh, we also have witnesses often on Sunday morning. And so today we hear from Angela. Zara. Zara is my pup who is right now laying at home struggling. 
from injury. So it's no mistake that here we are celebrating that part of our creation. I find that I tremble when I'm in the presence of God <laughs> and when I'm in front of people. And I do that because I have something to share that I'm passionate about. I tremble. <laughs> when I'm in the presence of God and his holiness, I recognize God's presence and holiness in each one of you who has chosen our Lord. So, um, I want to read some definitions to start. The first one is stewardship. And I looked these definitions up with a biblical meaning in, in my thoughts. So, stewardship being the utilizing and managing of all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of creation. So, <laughs> the next definition I would like to give you is activism. And my talk today is actually about activism. And I'm going to try to be as concise as possible because I know there's a message that comes after this. But activism, the definition I found, is about vigorous campaigning that brings about political or social change. It might also bring change from the inside of us. And, you know, I, I have found, I'm not that, uh, okay, so I'll go back a few years. I've always been the shy, reserved person I know you guys don't always see me that way. Okay. <laughs> but I was. I was. I was that person for most of my life. And when I took a look at people who were activists, I said, that's not me. I'm not that person. I, I, I don't relate to that. I'm not outspoken about things like that. These people... They're a little strange. <laughs> they're, they're peculiar. And they, they say things that make me feel uncomfortable on the inside. And so, um, as, as God would have us to do, I took another look at myself when uh, Craig asked me to come up and give this talk. And I wrote down a lot of things, and I threw it away. I wrote down more things, and I threw it away. And I wrote down some more things, and I threw that one away because God kept interrupting me with this word, activist and activism. So I took a look. And I'll give you another quick definition, humility. Fear of the Lord comes from the Latin humus, of the earth, humble, to be face down in the dirt, submitting to the authority of another without personal pride. Humility. I first became an activist because of my bad health as a kid. I found out I could change my diet, add supplements, change the outcome. I became an activist for having a healthy body. As a mother, I became an activist for healthy parenting. After divorce, I became an activist for single parenting. After suffering spiritual abuse during my second marriage, I became an activist for Christian values and truth. 
as my children and their friends shared themselves with me more fully, I became an activist for autism, ADHD, the LGBTQ community. Following the suicide of several of my children's classmates and the murder of another, I became an activist for awareness Activism is not born of peaceful or joyful experiences. Instead, it is born of ages old gut wrenching pain, emotional and physical torment. Measured out by people, even nations with stony hearts. I'm not going to read the scriptures, but Ezekiel 36. 23 through 27 talks about this stony heart. And I found another scripture, Psalms 9, 7 through 14, talks about God's response to activism. So I came here for the first time 30 years ago, and... <laughs> Yeah, that was a surprise to me, too. <laughs> I didn't come in the sanctuary because there were activists in here. I didn't want any part of that. Uh, I thought, you know, that's, that's not God's plan for me. So I went in the fellowship hall and fellowshiped and ate good food. I was invited by my dear friends, Ann and Wes Weaver, who have passed on now. Some of you know who they are and some of you don't, but they were a lovely couple who started a society here in Winston-Salem called the Very Vegetarian Society. And I learned so many things about healthy eating and healthy living, and they always, always did two things in their meetings other than the eating and, and celebrating of food. They talked about Parkway United Church of Christ every single time. They always invited us, every single time. The other thing they did, they brought activist issues to our dinner table every single time. And I'm very thankful for that because when I had a visit last fall from my cousin, who's part of the LGBTQ community, who said to me, we need to find a church for me to go to. Can we please try out some places here in town while I'm visiting? And so Parkway is one of the places that we ended up. And as you can see, I came and never left. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you all, and I really appreciate you and all that you are in my life and all the wonderful activist issues that you support. Our sacred text, Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. The whole Israelite community broke camp and set out from the Sin Desert to continue their journey, as the Lord had commanded. They set up their camp at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people argued with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were very thirsty for water. And they complained to Moses, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with this people, these people? They are getting ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of Israel's elders with you. Take in your hand the shepherd's rod that you used to strike the river Nile and go. I'll be there standing in front of you 
at the rock at Oreb. Hit the rock, water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses did so while Israel's elders watched. He called the place Massa and Marab because the Israelites argued with and tested the Lord, asking, is the Lord really with us or not? play uh, two American tunes this time. Um, uh, th this is uh, what's most often called old time music. Uh, it's uh, country music, folk music before bluegrass, uh, going way back to the 1700s. Uh, um, uh, well, the, and, and often these tunes are called fiddle tunes because the fiddle has always been the primary instrument. And it was joined in the 1800s by the banjo, which of course was an African, music, uh, African instrument. And then later other instruments, guitars, mandolins, uh, double basses. And uh, the second tune we're going to play is called Soldier's Joy. And it's really um, the granddaddy of all fiddle tunes. And uh, it's a real touchstone of this kind of music. So if, you, if this topic comes up, uh, you can name drop Soldier's Joy. and. Oh yeah, man, that's, that's something. <laughs> uh, I'll go ahead and say the name of the first tune, which is Whiskey Before Breakfast. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so Whiskey Before Breakfast and Soldier's Jewelry.
Is God with us or not? Is God among us or not? The people cry in the wilderness, dehydrated, agitated. The editors of this text come along and make a note to say, that's the name of the place they were at. Is God among us or not? When you're so down you can't move, you might ask, is God around? When you can't catch your breath or calm your nerves, you might ask, is sacred presence still the thing? When we get so scared about the latest school or grocery store shooting, the next hurricane or flood on the way, the next bit of news, uh, another friend has a cancer diagnosis. We ask, is God among us? When our elected officials hold such misguided priorities while the house is on fire, we want to cry out, is there still such thing as love? What people experience every single day is real, is a sense of God forsakenness. I remember many years ago, I was, I made the decision, I was going to, I spent some time in Cairo, Egypt, and I was going to take some buses from Cairo to Jerusalem. And we journeyed, we journeyed, we journeyed on the first bus and then dropped us off on the edge of the Suez Canal in the Sinai. And then we waited and we waited and we waited and I finished my novel and I ran out of water and the sun was scorching and uh, it was dry. And I realized right then and there that being in that desert without water is a pretty significant thing. The language used for these stories of wilderness wanderings and probably stories across human history are often those of putting God on trial, putting God on the docket, making a case against God. The Hebrew words actually indicate that's what's happening here in this story. Or at least putting God's representatives and prophets uh, to, to the test. Notice that the places throughout these stories of Exodus uh, are, are named. They, but they're not named. Oh, God provided. What an amazing act of power and mercy. Only one showed up in the nick of time. No, the places along this journey of the people in the wilderness of sin are named struggle, quarrel, bitterness. I've yet to see a name of a house of worship like that. You know, we, we, we have uh, names like the Oaks or uh, Elevation or Mountain Rise or river crossing but nobody says we're going to call our church is God among us or not <laughs> we're not going to put a sign out in front saying bitterness <laughs> because we expect the sacred presence to show up in the calm in the good in the, in, in the joyful in the big reveals of life and the tradition and the narrator in these stories makes it strikingly clear that very often the holy places are the places where we quarrel. We quarrel with the Holy One. Because quite often, with God, what flows from the places of death and despair is actually new possibility. So it's no accident that on this World Communion Sunday, the lectionary invites us to consider a story of a hopeful imagination where water springs out of dry rocks. What appears lifeless actually brings new life flow. The places of strife in our lives can become holy places. So mostly in the wilderness of Sinai, 
the people don't accuse God. That's just too esoteric. They take Moses on. They can't believe a word he says any more than they could believe what Pharaoh would tell them. But at least Egypt had some level of predictability. Oh, mercy, liberation has so much uncertainty, does it? Because our God doesn't force, cubbyhole, restrict. And because of that reality, that condition, we are going to have doubt and uncertainty and quarrel. Because we're not handed a recipe. This is how you live the spiritual life. So I'll tell you, no matter how much people around you might be witnessing to their absolute rock-solid faith, we all are bound many, many times to ask the question, is God among us or not? So I wonder if you have a place in your life where you take God to court. It's okay, mind you. Just look at the Psalms. A whole bunch of faithful people taking it to God letting all the bile and the ugliness hang out for the sake of the possibility of reconnection with the source of life. I'll tell you, sometimes the morning shower is my courtroom <laughs> where the tears are washed, where I can ask, what do you want from me? Where I can raise my fist in the veil of the steam so the other day, I was in the shower quarreling, <laughs> naked before God and the tile that probably needs some scrubbing. And it came to me as the water was hitting the back of my neck. Listen, smart Alec. Exactly, exactly what you asked for yesterday came into the life of a young one in precisely the way that you would imagine it could. Now that's not a solution, but it's sure an opportunity to give thanks for today. I tell you, life flow out of desperation. So when is it that you experience water from a rock? I think it's important to write about it. Talk about it. Thank you, Angela. Talk about it. Dance about it. Plant a perennial in the yard as a, as a memorial to it. Put a picture of, of what it represents on your bathroom mirror. Keep putting it in front of you. Keep putting it in front of all of us. Because it wasn't the first time in that wilderness wandering that the people quarreled and tested and got ornery. You remember the story at the Sea of Reeds. They said to Moses, oh, you, can't, you brought us out here to kill us. Where are the flesh pots? And then the water is open to create a path to freedom. Three days later, the water was so bitter they wouldn't drink it. Moses was instructed, toss a little wood into the pond, and then they could drink. They could quench their thirst. Not too long after that, they were so hangry that they were going to kill Moses. And then, in the early morning, the honey-like honey substance was gathered as manna from the plants outside the camp. Day after day, enough sustenance to keep going. And now in this story, they're thirsty, very, very thirsty. And once again, they are shown God has not abandoned you. In fact, Adonai tells Moses, take the resources of memory and community now when you need it most. You see that? That staff that's in your hand, oh, the one, you mean the one that I was holding 
at Mount Horeb, right, right next door to where we are right now, where I experienced the burning bush that was not consumed. That one? Oh, you mean the, the same staff that I lifted up so that the hail could come and the lightning could come to let Pharaoh know who was really in charge here? That staff? Oh, you mean the staff that I just raised up in the waters, parted, so, I, so we all could walk through to a new place? That staff? Yeah, exactly that one. And gather the elders of community so they can be witness with you. And Adonai says, I'm going to stand right in front of you. And water out of rock sustained life for another day. So I'll witness just for a couple moments of the little staffs that strike water to keep the community going as I see it right now. Tim, a couple of weeks ago, was struggling to breathe, struggling to talk to Sterling and his brothers and sisters-in-law and father in the ICU before he died. We gathered around and started singing hymns. Now, I'm not somebody who can keep a tune. I'm not a confident singer. But I was standing right next to Sterling. And I swear, for a few moments that, that night, I felt like I could sing on tune all night long. <laughs> sing in harmony, in fact. It was like a small miracle in the midst of, of despair. I've been wondering these last months, how are we going to find enough help to keep things going around here? Really wondering. And then I would go to nominating committee meetings. Anna, Judy, Larry. And I hear reports of some of you, yeah, they, they had lots of conversations, those three. Lots of hard work to, to get a sense of where you were and what you'd be willing to do. But I also heard reports of people coming forward and saying, this is what I want to do. This is what I feel led to do in the year ahead. This is what gives me joy. So from the bottom up, you have stepped forward, many of you. I consider that a small miracle in the life of the church. Last week, I was feeling a lot of stress and uncertainty. So I lay on the dewy grass in ultimate darkness of the night, where there weren't very many lights around. And I felt the burdens from my body slowly seep into the earth where they were held as the panoply of the Milky Way played overhead. And I don't know what came over me, but suddenly I started laughing uncontrollably. I just could not stop laughing, remembering all of the times I lay on the ground and looked up at the beautiful night sky. I consider it a small miracle. Staff striking stone. When we struggle, when we doubt, when we lash out at God, when we put God on the stand, when we become overcome with uncertainty, when we cry out, is God among us or not? We open the pathway to the possibility that we will experience water out of a rock. But not just that we might actually, when we do that, be tiny agents of shifting a little bit the holy presence in our midst. After many, many trials all along the Exodus journey, the people, still questioning, still doubting, still quarreling, gathered at that side of the Jordan River and heard the testimony on their behalf. God is merciful and gracious. God is slow to anger. God is abounding in steadfast love. And that wraps these stories. It doesn't take away the quarrel, but 
shows what can be revealed in the despair. It often takes strife to notice a holy place. So what are the times and the places you have witnessed a rock struck to bleed fresh, pure water? We depend on you. We depend on your prayers and your voice and your leadership and your time, your criticism, your gifts of offering to sustain us. We thank you. I think there's an offering plate in the back. There's an address we have on this building and there's a button on our website, all of them Vehicles to make a gift to, to keep us going in our witness and our love. Thank you. And I'm trying to f see what's next. A um, couple of things. Um, the next two Sundays, right after worship, we're going to have congregational conversations. Next Sunday, we're going to focus in worship and education. Is really trying to design, discern what are we going to do this year for Christmas Eve. December 24th is a Sunday for Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve. So we're throwing out some options and we want to have some discussion what you most want to do on that uh, special day. Um, the, the, the 15th, we'll gather, we'll hear some more from our vision team and a little bit about discernment about our property and um, our land. Um, the 15th is also in the afternoon, our annual crop walk downtown. So begin to think about supporting our crop walk uh, to support not only uh, global hunger response, but also hunger response right here in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County. As we mentioned earlier, the leadership of our congregation continues to reach out to individuals to have conversations, star conversation. This isn't to put the screws to you. Just relax. It's just to hear from you. What's connecting you? What's not connecting you right now to this spiritual community? So we hope you will respond to those invitations. I think that's enough. So um, as we move to uh, communion, everybody who longs for a sense of presence is welcome to participate. And if you want to stay in the pews, please do so. But we'll invite those who can to come forward down the center aisle, receive bread or gluten-free wafer, juice or wine, and then make your way around the outside to form a circle where we'll hold the elements and we will receive together. At that place around in our circle, we'll sing our closing song, Guide My Feet. Guide my feet is a spiritual. So we, we um, approach the tradition with awe and respect, realizing the words of this expressed an ancient longing for freedom, that holy presence would abide with those seeking freedom from enslavement, that they would not be caught. How do we think about our own liberation these days without being caught by all of the things that can hold us back? Supper's ready. You belong. 
And we give thanks to God. What is it we give thanks to God for? Lift, lift up a word or a phrase. The word of God. Family. Church family, joy. Friends, pets. Home. God's steadfast love. Water. Good food. Sunshine. The moon. Hugs, music, friends, God's blessings, good books, God's healing. So you know the story, right? Before Jesus was arrested by Roman soldiers, he was eating a, a significant meal in the, in the life of the Jewish community to celebrate the Passover. While they were eating and they were remembering how Greek God freed them. Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, Jesus broke it and he gave it to each one saying, this is the bread of life. Take and eat. And after supper, in a similar way, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, this is the cup of blessing of ongoing covenantal promise as often as you drink a drink to remember me but also everything that we got going on here with one another let's pray come holy spirit come bless the bread bless the gluten-free wafers bless the cup bless each one of us bless all the people all over the world who are sharing communion in their own way, with their own elements, in their own setting, with their own challenges. Amen.
bread of life. Take and drink. Or, take and drink. <laughs> with us. Wheel with us while we journey this race. May we find in the weeks, weeks ahead the ways to accompany one another on the journey that we may glimpse little signs of sacred presence along the way to give us hope, to show love and justice. Go forth in shalom. Amen. Amen. Amen.